Good evening and welcome once again to Drunk Shakespeare. Tonight we are tackling Pericles and it has been almost a year since we've begun. So we are really getting through the entire canon and it's very exciting. Uh, guest directed tonight by uh, one of our most prolific actors, Chris Keller. Thank you very much for, uh, for doing us the honor of, of leading us this evening. So without further ado, please enjoy Pericles. To sing a song that old was sung, from ashes ancient Gower is come, assuming man's infirmities, to glad your ear and please your eyes. It hath been sung at festivals, on ember eves and holy days, and lords and ladies in their lives have read it for restoratives. The purchase is to make men glorious, et bonum quo antiqui eo melius. If you, born in these latter times, when wits more ripe, accept my rhymes, and that to hear an old man sing, may your wishes pleasure bring. If I, I life would wish, and that I might waste it for you like taper light. This Antioch then, Antiochus the Great, built up this city for his chiefest seat, the fairest in all Syria. I tell you what mine authors say, this king unto him took a peer, who died and left a faint female heir, so buxom, blithe, and full of face, as heaven had lent her all his grace, with whom the father liking took, and her to incest did provoke. Bad child, worse father, to entice his own to evil should be done by none but custom what they did begin was with long use accounted accounted no sin the beauty of this sinful dame made many princes thither frame to seek her as a bedfellow in marriage pleasures playfellow which to prevent he made a law to keep her still and men in awe that whoso asked her for his wife his riddle told not lost his life so for her many a white did die as yon grim looks do testify what now ensues to the judgment of your eye i give my cause who best can justify young prince of Tyre, you have at large received the danger of the task you undertake. I have Antiochus, and with a soul emboldened with the glory of her praise, think death no hazard in this enterprise. You it. Bring in our daughter, clothed like a bride, for the embracement even of Jove himself, at whose conception the Lucina reigned, Nature this dowry ga gave to glad her presence. The Senate House of Planets all did sit to knit in her their best perfection. Oh, see where she comes, apparelled like the spring, graces her subjects and her thoughts. The king of every virtue gives renown to men. Her face, the book of praises, where is read nothing but curious pleasures, as from thence sorrow were ever raised, and testy wrath could never be her mild companion. You gods that made me man and sway in love, that have inflamed desire in my breast to taste the fruit of yon celestial tree or die in the adventure, be my helps as I am son and servant to your will to compass such a boundless happiness. And Pericles. That would be son to great Antiochus. Before thee stands this fair Hesperity, with golden fruit, but dangerous to be touched. For death-like dragons here affright thee hard. 
of faith, like heaven, suffice to see to view the countless glory which desert must gain, and which without desert, because thine eye presumes to reach, all the whole heap must die. Yon sometimes famous princes, like thyself, drawn by report, adventurous by desire, tell thee with speechless tongues and semblance pale, that without covering save yon field of stars, here they stand martyrs, slain in Cupid's wars, whose dead cheek advise thee to desist for going on death net, none resist. Antiochus, I thank thee, who hath taught my frail mortality to know itself, and by those fearful objects to prepare this body, like to them, to what I must. For death remembered should be like a mirror who tells us life's but breath to trust it error. I'll make my will then, and as sick men do who know the world, see heaven, but feeling well gripe not at earthly joys as erst they did. So I bequeath a happy peace to you and all good men, as every prince should do. My riches to the earth from whence they came. But my unspotted fire of love to you, thus ready for the way of life or death, I wait the sharpest blow. Scorning advice, read the conclusion then. Read and not founded his degreed, as those before thee, thou thyself shall bleed. Of all said yet, Mayest thou prove prosperous of all said yet, I wish thee happiness. Like a bold champion, I assume the lists, nor ask advice of any other thought but faithfulness and courage. <sighs> I, I am no viper, yet I feed on mother's flesh, which did me breed. I sought a husband in which labor I found that kindness in a father. His father, son, and husband mild, I mother, wife, and yet his child. How they may be, and yet in two, as you will live, resolve it, you. Sharp physic is the last. But all oh, you powers that gives heaven countless eyes to view men's acts, why cloud they not their sights perpetually if this be true, which makes me pale to read it. Fair glass of light, I loved you and, and could still were not this glorious casket stored with ill. But I must tell you now my thoughts revolt for he's no man on whom perfections wait that knowing sin within will touch the gate. You are a fair vial, and your sense the strings who fingered to make man his lawful music would draw heaven down and all the gods hearken. But being laid upon before your time, hell only dances at so harsh a charm. Oh, good sooth, I care not for you. Heracles, touch not upon thy life, for that's an article within our law, as dangerous as the rest. Your time's expired. Either expound now or receive your sentence. Great king, few love to hear the sins. They love to act. Twould, twould braid yourself too near for me to tell it. Who has, who has a book of all that monarchs do? He's more secure to keep it shut than shown. 
for vice, repeated, is like the wandering wind blows dust in others' eyes to spread itself, and, and yet the end of all is bought thus dear. The breath is gone, and the sore eyes see clear to stop the air would hurt them. The blind mole casts copped hills towards heaven to tell the earth is thronged by man's oppression, and the poor worm doth die for it. Kings are earth's gods, in vice their laws, their will. And, and if Jove stray, who dares say Jove doth ill? It is enough, you know. And it is fit what being more known grows worse to smother it. All love the womb that their first being bred, then give my tongue like leave to love my head. Heaven, that I had thy head, he has found the meaning, but I will gloss with him. Young Prince of Fire, though by the tenor of our strict edict, your exposition misinterpreting, we might proceed to cancel of your days. Yet hope, succeeding from so fair a tree as your fair self, the tunus otherwise, as your fair self. Forty days longer we do respite you, with by which time our secret be undone, this mercy shows we'll joy in such a son. And until then, your entertain shall be as doth befit our honor and your worth. Oh, how courtesy would seem to cover sin when what is done is like a hypocrite, the which is good in nothing but in sight. If it be true that, that I interpret false, then were it certain you were not so bad as with foul incest to abuse your soul. Where now you're both a father and a son by your untimely claspings with your child. Which pleasures fit a husband, not a father? And she, an eater of her mother's flesh by the defiling of her parents' bed. And both like serpents are, who, though they feed on sweetest flowers, yet they poison breed. Antioch, farewell. For wisdom sees these men blush not in actions blacker than the night will show no course to keep them from the light. One sin I know another doth provoke. Murders as near to lust as flame to, to smoke. Poison and treason are the hands of sin. I am the targets to put off the shame. Then, lest my life be cropped to keep you clear by flight, I'll shun the danger which I fear. He hath found the meaning for which we mean to have his head. He must not live to trumpet forth my infamy till the world Antiochus doth sin such a loathed manner. Therefore, instantly this prince must die, for by his fall, thy honor must keep high. Who attends us here there? Doth your highness call? Thaliard, you of our, of our chamber, Thaliard, and our mind partakes her private actions to your secrecy, and for your faithfulness, we will advance you, Thaliard. Behold, here's poison and here's gold. We hate the prince of Tyre, and thou must kill him. It fits thee not to ask us the reason why, because we bid it. Say, is it done? My lord, tis done. Enough. Let 
your breath, cool yourself. Hell in your haste. Did Pericles has fled? Thou wilt live. Fly after. And like an arrow shot from a well-experienced archer, hits the mark his eye doth level at. So thou never return, unless thou say Prince Pericles is dead. My lord, if I can get him within my pistol's length, I'll make him sure enough. So farewell unto your highness. Galliard, adieu. So Pericles be dead, my heart can lend no succor to my head. Let none disturb us. Why should this change of thoughts, the sad companion, dull-eyed melancholy, be my so used a guest as not an hour in this day's glorious walk or peaceful night, the tomb where grief should sleep can breed me quiet. Here pleasures court mine eyes, and mine eyes shun them. And danger which I feared is at Antioch, whose arm seems far too short to hit me here, yet neither pleasure's art can join my spirits, nor yet the other's distance comfort me. That it is thus, passions of the mind that have their first conception by misdread have after nourishment in life by care. And what was first, but fear, what might be done, grows elder now, and cares it be not done. And so with me. The great Antiochus, against whom I am too little to contend, since he's so great, can make his will, his act, will think me speaking. Oh, I, I swear to silence. No boots at me to say I honor him if he suspect I may dishonor him. And what may make him blush in being known, he'll stop the course by which it might be known. With hostile forces, he'll o'erspread the land, and with the ostent of war, will look so huge amazement shall drive courage from the state. Our men be vanquished ere they do resist, and subjects punished that ne'er thought offense, which Care of them, not pity of myself, who am no more but as the tops of trees which fence the roots they grow by and defend them, makes both my body pine and soul to languish and punish that. Before that, he would punish. Joy and all comfort in your sacred breast and keep your mind till you return to us Peaceful and comfortable. Peace, peace, and give experience tongue. They do abuse the king that flatter him. For flattery is the bellows that blows up sin. The thing that which is flattered, but a spark, to which that wind gives heat and stronger glowing. Whereas reproof obedient and in order fits kings as they are men, for they may err. When Signor Sooth here does proclaim peace, he flatters you, makes war upon your life. Prince, pardon me, or strike me if you please. I cannot be much lower than my knees. Draw, leave us else. But let your cares or look with shipping and what laddings in our haven and then return to us. Helicanus. Thou hast moved us. What seest thou in our look? An angry brow, my lord. If there be such a dart in princes' frowns, how durst thy tongue move anger to our face? How dares the plants look up to heaven from whence they have their nourishment? Thou knowest I have power to take thy light from thee. I have ground the ax myself. Do but you strike the blow. Rise, prithee, rise. Sit down. Thou art no flatterer, and I thank thee for it. And heaven forbid the kings should let their ears hear their faults hid. 
fit counselor and servant for a prince who by thy wisdom makes a prince thy servant. What wouldst thou have me do? To bear with patience such griefs as you yourself do lay upon yourself. Thou speaks like a physician, Helicanus, that ministers a potion unto me, that thou wouldst tremble to receive thyself. Attend me, then. I went to Antioch, whereas thou knowest, against the face of death, I sought the purchase of a glorious beauty, for whence an issue I might propagate. Our, our arms to princes and brings joy to subjects. Her face was to mine eye beyond all wonder. The rest, hark in thine ear, as black as incest, which by my knowledge found. The sinful father seemed not to strike, but smooth. <laughs> but thou knowest this, tis time to fear when tyrants seem to kiss, which fear grew so grew in me, I hither fled under the covering of a careful knight who seemed my good protector, and, and being here, bethought me what was past, what might succeed. I, I knew him tyrannous, and tyrants' fears decrease not, but grow faster than the years. And should he doubt, as no doubt he doth, that I should open to the listening air, how many worthy princes' bloods were shed to keep his bed of blackness unlaid? Oh! To lop that doubt, he'll fill this land with arms and make a pretense of wrong that I have done him. When all, for mine, if I may call to fans, must feel war's blow, who spares not innocence, which love to all, of, of which thine self art one, who now approvest me for it. Oh, alas, sir. Drew sleep out of mine eyes, blood from my cheeks, musings into my mind with thousand doubts how I might stop this tempest ere it came. And finding little comfort to relieve them, I, I thought it princely charity to grieve for them. Well, <laughs> my lord, since since you have given me leave to speak, freely will I speak. Antiochus, you fear, and justly too, I, I think you fear the tyrant who either by public war or private treason will take away your life. Therefore, my Lord, go travel for a while till that his rage and anger be forgot or till the destinies do cut his thread of life your rule direct to any. If to me day serves not light more faithful than I'll be. I do not doubt thy faith. But should he wrong my liberties in my absence? We'll mingle our bloods together in the earth from whence we had our being and our birth. Tyre, I now look from thee then and to Tarsus intend my travel, where I'll hear from thee, and by whose letters I'll dispose myself. The care I had and have of subjects good on thee I lay, whose wisdom's strength can bear it. I'll take thy word or faith, not ask thine own. Who shuns not to break one will crack both, but, but in our orbs, We'll live surround and safe that time of both this truth shall ne'er convince. Thou shouldst the subjects sh shine, and I a true prince. So, this is Tyre. This is the court. Here must I kill King Pericles. And if I do it not, I'm sure to be hanged at home. It's dangerous. Well, I perceive he was a wise fellow and had good discretion that being bid to ask what he would of the king, desired he might know none of his secrets. <laughs> now do I see he had some reason for it. 
for if a king bid a man be a villain, he's bound by the indenture of his oath to be one. Here come the Lord to fire. Hmm. You shall not need my fellow peers of Tyre further to question me of your king's departure. His sealed commission left in trust with me does speak sufficiently he's gone to travel. If further yet you will be satisfied, why, as it were, unlicensed of your loves, he would depart. I'll give some light unto you. Being at Antioch. What from Antioch? Royal Antiochus, on what cause I know not, took some displeasure at him. At least he judged so, and doubting lest he had erred or sinned, to show his sorrow, he'd correct himself, so puts himself unto the shipman's toil, with whom each minute threatens life or death. Well, I perceive I shall not be hanged now, although I would. But since he's gone, the king's ears must please. He staked the land to perish at the sea. I'll present myself. Peace to the lords of fire. Lord Thaliot from Antiochus is welcome. From him I come with message unto princely Pericles. But since my landing, I've understood your lord has betook himself to unknown travels. Now message must return from whence it came. We have no reason to desire it, commended to our master, not to us. Yet, ere you shall depart, this we desire. As friends to Antioch, we may feast entire. My Diana, shall we rest here and by relating tales of others' grief, see if it will teach us to forget our own. Uh. That were to blow at fire and hope to quench it. Fruit dig, digs hills because they're, they do aspire, throws down one mountain to cast up a higher. Oh, my distressed lady. Even <laughs> such our griefs are here. They are but felt and seen with mistress' eyes, but like groves being topped, they higher rise. <laughs> Diana. Who wanteth food and will not say she wants it or can conceal his hunger till he famish. Our tongues and sorrows do sound deep our woes into the air. Our eyes do weep till lungs fetch breath that cannot proclaim them louder that if heaven slumber while their creatures want, they may awake their helpers to comfort them. I'll then discourse our woes felt several years and wanting breath to speak, help me with tears. I'll do my best. I'll do my best, lady. This Tarsus, or which I have the government, a city on whom plenty held full hand, for riches strewed herself, even in her streets, whose towers bore heads so high they kissed the clouds, and strangers ne'er beheld it, but wonderful at, mm -hmm. whose men and dames so jetted and adorned, like one another's glass to trim them by, their tables were stored full to glad the sight, and not so much to feed on us delight. All poverty was scorned and pride so great, the name of help grew odious to repeat. Well, tis true. <laughs> but see what heaven can do by this our change. These mouths who but of late earth, sea, and air were all too little to content and please, although they gave their creatures in abundance as houses are defiled for want of use. They are now starved for want of exercise. Those palates who not yet two savors younger must have inventions to delight the taste would now be glad of bread and beg for it. These mothers who to muzzle up their babes thought not too curious are ready now to eat those little darlings whom they loved. So sharp are hunger's teeth that man and wife draw lots who first shall die to lengthen life. Here stands a lord and there a lady weeping. Here many sink, yet those which see them fall have scarce strength left to give them burial. Is not this true? 
cheeks and hollow eyes do witnesses. Let those cities that of Plenty's cup and her prosperity so largely taste with their superfluous riots, hear these tears, the misery of Tarsus be theirs. Where's the Lord Governor? Here. Speak out thy sorrows, which thee bringst in haste, for comfort is too far to us expect. We have described upon our neighboring shore a portly sail of ships make hitherward. Not as much. One sorrow never comes but brings an heir that may succeed in his inheritor. And so is ours. Some neighboring nation, taking advantage of our misery, hath stuffed the hollow vessels with their power to beat us down, the which are down already, and make a conquest of unhappy men, whereas no glory got to overcome. That's the least fear, for by the semblance of their white flags displayed, they bring us peace and come to us as favorers, not as foes. Now speaks like hymns and tutored to repeat, who makes the fairest show means most deceit. But bring they that what will and what they can, what need we fear. The ground's the lowest and we are halfway there. Go, tell their general we attend them here to know for what he comes and whence he comes and what he craves. I go, my lady. Welcome is peace if he on peace consist, if wars we are unable to resist. Lady Governor, for so we hear you are, let not our ships and number of our men be like a beacon fire to amaze your eyes. We have heard your miseries as far as Tyre and seen the desolation of your streets. Nor come we to add sorrow to your tears, but to relieve them of their heavy load. And these are ships you happily may think are like the Trojan horse was stuffed within with bloody veins expecting overthrow are stored with corn to make your needy bread and give them life whom hunger starved half dead. The gods of Greece protect you and will pray for you. Arise, I, I pray you rise. We do not look for reverence, but for love and harborage for ourselves, our ships and men. The which when any shall not gratify or pay you with unthankfulness and thought, be it our wives, our children, or ourselves, the curse of heaven and men succeed their evils. Till when, the which I hope shall never be seen, your grace is welcome to our town and us. Which welcome will accept. Feast here a while and till our stars that frown lend us a smile. Here have you seen a mighty king, his child I wis, to incest bring. A better prince and benign lord that will prove awful both in deed and word. Be quiet then, as men should be, till he hath passed necessity. I'll show you those in trouble's reign, losing a might, a mountain gain. The good in conversation to whom I give my benison is still at Tarsus, where each man thinks all is writ, he speak and he can. And to, and to remember what he does, build his statue to make him glorious. But tidings to the contrary are brought to your eyes. What need speak I? Good Helicane that stayed at home, not to eat honey like a drone, from others' labours, for though he strives, bad, keep good alive, and to fulfil his prince's desire, sends words of all that haps entire. How Thaliard came full bent with sin, and had intent to murder him. I dare think he'll prove to Desdemona our most dear husband. Rebecca. No. How Thaliard came full bent with sin and had intent to murder him, 
And that in Tarsus was not best, longer for him to make his rest. He, doing so, put forth to seas, where when men been, there's seldom ease. For now the winds begin to blow, thunder above and deeps below make such unquiet that the ship should house him safe is racked and split and he good prince having lost all by waves from coast to coast is tossed all perishing of man of, of pelf nay nought escaped but himself till fortune tired with doing bad threw him ashore to give him glad and here he comes. What shall be next? Pardon old Gower, this long's the text. Oh, you cease your eye, are you angry stars of heaven? Wind, rain, and thunder. Remember, earthly man is but a substance that must yield to you. And I, as fits my nature, do obey you. Alas, the seas hath cast me on the rocks washed me from shore to shore and left my breath nothing to think on but ensuing death let it suffice the greatness of your powers to have bereft a prince of all his fortunes and having thrown him from your watery grave here to have death in peace all is all he'll crave what ho pilch come and bring away the net <laughs> what patch preach i say what say you master oh look how thou stirrest now come away or i'll fetch thee with a wenyan faith master i'm thinking of the poor men that were cast away before us even now uh, alas poor souls it grieves my heart to hear what pitiful cries they made to us to help them when well a day we could scarce help ourselves Nay, master, said not I as much when I saw the porpoise, how he bounced and tumbled. They say they're half fish, half flesh, a plague on them. They'll never come, but I look to be washed. Master, I marvel how the fishes live in the sea. Why, as men do a land, the great ones eat up the little ones. I can compare our rich misers to nothing so fitly as to a whale. He plays and tumbles driving the poor fry before him, and at last devours them all in a mouthful. <laughs> Such whales have I heard on on the land, who never leave gaping till they swallow the whole parish. Church, steeple, bells, and all. A pretty moral. <laughs> <laughs> but master, if I'd been the sexton, I would have been that day in the belfry. Why, man? Because he would have swallowed me too. And when I'd been in his belly, I would have kept up such a jangling of the bells that he should never have left till he cast bells, steeple, church, and perish up again. But if the good King Simonides were of my mind, Simonides, we would purge the land of these drones that rob the bee of her honey. How from the finny subject of the sea these fishers tell the infirmities of men and from their watery empire recollect that all that may men approve or men detect. Peace be at your labor, honest fisherman. Honest good fellow, what's that? If it be a day fits, you search out of the calendar and nobody look after it. May you see the sea have cast upon your coast. <laughs> what a drunken knave was the sea to cast thee in our way. A man whom both the waters and the wind in that vast tennis court hath made the ball for them to play upon. Entreats you pity him. He asks of you that never used to beg. No, friend, can you not beg? <laughs> Here's them in our country of Greece gets more with begging than we can do with working. Canst thou catch any fishes then? I, I I never practiced it. Nay, then thou wilt starve, sure, and for here's nothing to be got nowadays unless thou canst fish for it. I, what I have been, I have forgot to know, but what I am want teaches me to think on. A man thronged up with cold. My veins are chill and have no more life than may suffice to give my tongue that heat to 
ask your help, which if you shall refuse, when I am dead, for that I am a man, pray you see me buried. <laughs> Die, quotha? Now, God's forbid it. And I have a gown. Here, come, put it on. Keep thee warm. Oh, now, afford me a handsome fellow. Come, thou shalt go home, and we'll have flesh for holidays, fish for fasting days, and more or puddings and flapjacks, and thou shalt be welcome. I thank you, sir. Hark you, my friend. You said you could not beg. I did, but crave. But crave? Then I'll go to crave or two, and so I shall escape whipping. Why, are you beggar's whip then? Oh, not at all, my friend, not at all. For if all your beggars were whipped, I would wish no better office than to be beetle. <laughs> but, Master, I'll go draw up the net. How well this honest mirth becomes their labor. <laughs> uh, hark, sir, do you know where you are? Not well. <laughs> Why, I'll tell you. This is called Pentapolis, and our king, the good Simonides. The good Simonides, do you call him? Aye, sir. And he deserves so to be called for his peaceable reign and good government. He's a happy king, since he gains from his subjects the name of good by his government. How far is his court distant from the shore? Oh, Mary, sir, half a day's journey. And I'll tell you, he hath a fair daughter, and tomorrow is her birthday. And there are princes and knights come from all parts of the world to joust and tourney for her love. Oh, were my fortunes equal to my desires, I could wish to make one there. Oh, sir, things must be as they may. And what a man cannot get, he may lawfully deal for his wife's soul. Mm -hmm. uh, help! Master, help! Here's a fish hangs in the net like a poor man's right in the law. Twill hardly come out. Uh, boots on it, too. Comes out at last. And turns out it's just rusty armor. An armor, friends. I pray you, let me see it. Oh, thanks, fortune. Yet that after all my crosses, thou givest me somewhat to repair myself. And though it was mine own part of my heritage, which my dead father did bequeath to me with this strict charge, even as he left his life, keep it, my Pericles. It hath been a shield twixt me and death and pointed to this brace. For that it saved me, keep it. In like necessity, the which Gods protect thee from, may defend thee. It kept where I kept. I so dearly loved it till the rough seas that spares not any man took it in rage. Though calmed, have, have given it again. <laughs> I thank thee for it. My ship racks now's no ill since I have here my father gained his will. Uh, what mean you, sir? to beg of you, kind friends, this coat of worth, for it was some time target to a king. I know it by, by this mark. He loved me dearly, and for his sake I wish the having of it. Then, and then you'd guide me to your sovereign's court, where with it I may appear gentleman. And if that ever my low fortune's better, I'll pay your bounties. Till then, rest your debtor. Ah. Why, wilt thou tourney for the lady? I'll show the virtue what I have borne in arms. <sighs> Why, do you take it, and the gods give you the good on it. Ay, but hark you, my friend, t'was we that made up this garment through the rough seams of the waters. And there are certain condolements, certain veils. I hope, sir, if you thrive, you'll remember from whence you had them. Believe it. I will. By your furtherance, I am clothed in steel. And in spite of all the rupture of the sea, this jewel holds his bidding on my arm. 
until unto thy value, I will mount myself upon a courser whose delightful steps shall make the gazer joy to see him tread. Only my friend, I, I yet am unprovided of a pair of paces. <laughs> We'll sure provide. Thou shalt have my best gown to make thee a pair, and I'll bring thee to the court myself. Then honor be but a goal to my will. This day I'll rise, or else add ill to ill. Are the knights ready to begin the triumph? They are, my liege, and stay your coming to present themselves. Return them, we are ready, and our daughter here, in honor of whose birth these triumphs are, sits here like beauty's child, whom nature gat for men to see and seeing wonder at. It pleaseth you, my royal father, to express my commendations great, whose merits less. It's fit it should be so, for princes are a model of which heaven makes like it to itself. As jewels lose their glory if neglected, so princes the renowns if not respected. Tis now your honor, daughter, to entertain the labor of each knight in his device. Which to preserve mine's honor, I'll perform. Who is the first that doth prefer himself? A knight of Sparta, my renowned father. And the device he bears upon his shield is a black a warrior reaching at the sun, the word lux tua vita me. Hmm. He loves you well that holds his life of you. Who is the second that presents himself? A prince of Macedon, my royal father. And the device he bears upon his shield is an armed knight that's conquered by a lady. The motto thus in Spanish, Hui per dolera, qui per forza. And what's the third? The third of Antioch. And his device, a wreath of chivalry. The word, me, Pompeii, provexit apex. What is the fourth? A burning torch that's turned upside down. The word, Qui me alit me extinguit. Which shows the beauty hath his power and will, which can as inflame as it can kill. The fifth, in hand environed with clouds, holding out gold that's by the touch tone stride. The motto thus, six spectanda fides. And what's the sixth and last, the which the knight himself with such a graceful courtesy delivered? He seems to be a stranger, but his present is a withered branch that's only green at top. The motto, in hack spi vivo. Pretty moral. From the dejected state wherein he is, he hopes by you his fortunes yet may flourish. He had need been better than his outward show. Can any way speak in his just command? For by his rusty outside, he appears to have Practice more the whip start than the lion. <laughs> he well may be. He a may well be a stranger, for he comes to an honored triumph strangely furnished. And on set purpose, let his armor rust until this day to sour it in the dust. Opinions, but a fool that makes us scan the outward habit by the inward man. But stay, the nights are coming. We will withdraw into the gallery. The mean knight. Knights. To say your welcome were superfluous, to place upon the volume of your deeds, as in a title page your worth is in arms, were more than you expect or more than fit, ev since every worth in the show commends itself. Prepare for mirth, for mirth becomes a feast you are princes and my guests. But you, my knight and guest, to whom this wreath of victory I give and crown you king of this day's happiness. It is more by fortune, lady, than my merit. 
Call it by what you will, the day is yours. And here, I hope, is none that envies it. In framing an artist, art hath thus decreed to make some good but others to exceed, and you are her labored scholar. Come, queen of the feast, for daughter, so you are. Here, take your place. Marshal, the rest as they deserve their grace. We are honored by good Simonides. Your presence glads your days. Honor we love, for who hates honor, hates the gods above. Sir, yonder is your place. The mother is more fit. And not, sir, for we are gentlemen, have neither in our hearts nor outward eyes envies the great, nor shall the low despise. You are right, courteous knight. Sit, sir, sit. By Jove, I wonder that this king of thoughts, these cates resist me, he is not thought upon. Gina, that is queen of marriage. All viands that I eat do seem unsavory, wishing him my meat. Sure, he's a gallant gentleman. He's but a country gentleman, has done no more than knights have done, has broken a staff or so, so let it pass. To me, he seems like diamond to glass. Young kings to me, like my father's picture, which tells in that glory once he was, had princes sit like stars about his throne, and he the sun for them to reverence. None that beheld him, but like lesser lights did veil their crowns to his supremacy. Or now his sons like a glow worm in that night, the which hath fire and darkness, none in light. Whereby I see the times, the king of men, he's both their parent and he is their grave and give, gives them what he will, not what they crave. What? Are you merry knights? Can be other in this royal presence. Here with a cup that's stored unto the brim, as do you love, fill to your mistress's lips. We drink this health to you. We thank your grace. Yet pause a while. Yon knight doth sit too melancholy as, it, as if the entertainment in our court had not a show might countervail his worth. Note it, not you, Thesa? What is to me, my father? Oh, attend, my daughter. Princes in this should live like gods above who freely give to everyone that come to honor them. And princes do not not doing so are like gnats, which make sound, but like killed or wandered at. Therefore, to make his entrance more sweet, here say we drink this standing bowl of wine to him. Alas, my father, it befits not me and to a stranger knight to be so bold. He may my proper take for an offense since men takes women's gifts for impudence. How? Do as I bid you or you'll move me else. Now by the gods, he could not please me better. And furthermore, tell him we desire to know of him, of whence he is, his name and parentage. The king, my father, sir, has talked to you. I thank him. Wishing it so much blood unto your life. I thank both him and you, and I pledge him freely. And further, he desires to know of you, of whence you are, your name and parentage. A gentleman of Tyre, my name is Pericles. My education been in arts and arms, who looking for adventures in the world was by the rough seas reft of ships and men, and after shipwreck driven upon this shore. He thanks your grace. Names himself Pericles, a gentleman of time. Why, who only by misfortune of the seas bereft of ships and men cast on this shore? Now, by the gods, I pity his, mis his mis misfortune and will awake him from his melancholy. Come, gentlemen, we sit too long on trifles and waste the time which looks for other revels. Even in your armors, as you are addressed, will well become a soldier's dance. 
I will not have an excuse with this saying. Loud music is too harsh for the ladies' heads, since they love men in arms as well as beds. So this is well asked. Twas so well performed. Come, sir. Here's a lady that wants breathing too, and I have heard you knights of Tyre are excellent in making ladies trip, and that their measures are as excellent. And those that practice them, they are, my lord. Oh, that's as much as you would be denied of your fair courtesy. Unclasp, unclasp. Thanks, gentlemen. To all, all have done well. But you, the best. Pages and lights to conduct these knights into their several lodgings. Yours, sir, we have given order to be our neck, next our own. I am at your grace's pleasure. Princes, it is too late to talk of love, and that's the mark I know you level at. Therefore, each one betake him to his rest. Tomorrow, all for speeding do their best. No, Eskenes, know this of me. Antiochus from incest lived not free, for which thou, the most high gods, not minding longer to withhold the vengeance that they had in store due to this heinous capital offense, even in the height and pride of all his glory, when he was seated in a chariot of inestimable value and his daughter with him. A fire from heaven came and shriveled up those bodies even to loathing, for they so stunk that all those eyes adored them ere their fall, scorn now their hands should give them burial. Twas very strange. And yet but justice, for though this king were great, his greatness was no guard to bar heaven's shaft, but sin had his reward. Tis very true. See, not a man in private conference or council has respect with him but he. Shall no longer grieve without reproof. And cursed be he that will not second it. Follow me then, Lord Helicane, a word. With me? And welcome. <laughs> Happy day, my lords. Know that our griefs are risen to the top, and now at length they overflow their banks. Your griefs? For what? Wrong not your prince you love. Wrong not yourself then, noble Helicane. But if the prince do live, let us salute him, or know what grounds made happy by his breath. If in the world he live, we'll seek him out. If in his grave he rests, we'll find him there, and be resolved he lives to govern us, or dead gives us cause to mourn his funeral and leave us to our free election. Whose death's indeed the strongest in our censor and knowing this kingdom is without a head, like goodly buildings left without a roof shall soon fall to ruin your noble self that best know how to rule and how to reign with us submit unto our sovereign. Live noble Helicane. Live noble Helicane. <sighs> Try honor's cause, forbear your suffrages. If that you love Prince Pericles, forbear. Take I your wish, I leap into the seas, where hourly trouble for a minute's ease. A twelve month longer, let me entreat you to forbear the absence of your king. If in which time expired he not return, <sighs> I shall with aged patience bear your yoke. But if I cannot win you his to this love, go search like nobles, like noble subjects, and in your search spend your adventurous worth, whom if you find and win unto return, you shall like diamonds sit about his crown. To wisdom he's a fool that will not yield. And since Lord Helicane enjoineth us, we with our travels will endeavor. Then you love us, we you, and will clasp hands. When peers thus knit, a kingdom ever stands. Oh. 
Good morrow to the good Siamides. Knights, from my daughter, this is to let you know that from this 12 months she'll not undertake a married life. Her reason to herself is only known, which from her by no means can I get. May we not get access to her, my lord? Faith, by no means. She hath so strictly tied her to her chamber that tis impossible. One twelve moons more she'll wear Diana's livery. This by the eye of Cynthia hath she vowed, and by on her virgin honor will not break it. Loath to bid farewell, we take our leave. So, they are well dispatched. Not of my daughter's letter. She tells me more here. She'll wed the stranger knight, or never more to view, nor day or night, light. Tis well, mistress, your choice agrees with mine. I like that well. Nay, how absolute she's in it. No minding whether I dislike or no. Uh, well, I do commend her choice and will no longer have it be delayed. Soft, here come, here, she, here he comes. Oh, I must assemble it. All fortune to the good Simonides. To you as much, sir. I am beholding to you for your sweet music this last night. I do protest my ears were never better fed with such delightful, pleasing harmony. It is your grace's pleasure to command, not my desert. Sir, you are music's master. The worst of all are scholars, my good lord. Let me ask you one thing. What do you think of my daughter, sir? A, a most virtuous princess. And she is fair too, is she not? As fair as a fair day in summer. Wondrous fair. Sir, my daughter thinks very well of you. I so well that you must be her master and she will be your scholar. Therefore look to it. I'm unworthy for her schoolmaster. She thinks not so. Peruse this writing else. What's here? A letter that, that she loves the knight of Tyre? Tis the king's subtlety to have my life. Oh, seek not to entrap me, ye gracious lord, a stranger and distressed gentleman that never aimed so high to love your daughter, but bent all offices to honor her. Thou hast bewitched my daughter, and thou art a villain. By the gods, I have not. Never did thought of mine levy offense, nor never did my actions yet commence a deed might gain her love or your displeasure. Traitor, thou liest. Traitor? I, traitor. Even in his throat. Unless it be the king that calls me traitor, I return the lie. Now by the gods, I do applaud his courage. My actions are as noble as my thoughts that never relish of a base descent. I came unto your court for honor's cause and not to be a rebel to her state. And he that otherwise accounts of me, this sword shall prove that he's honor's enemy. No, because my daughter, she can witness it. Then, as you are as virtuous as fair, resolve your angry father, if my tongue did e'er solicit, or my hand subscribe to any syllable that made love to you. My sir, say if you had, who takes offense at that would make me glad. Yea, mistress, are you so peremptory? I am glad on it with all my heart. I'll tame you. I'll bring you in subjection. Will you not having my consent bestow your love and your affections upon a stranger? Who for aught I know be, may be, nor can I think the contrary, as good in blood as myself. Therefore hear you, mistress, either frame your will to mine, and you, sir, hear you, either but be ruled by me, or I'll make you man and wife. Nay, come your hands and lips must seal it too. And being joined, I'll thus your hopes destroy. And further grief, God give you joy. What, are you both pleased? Yes, if you love me, sir. Even as my life, my blood that fosters it. Oh, what, are you both agreed? Yes, if it yes, is. Yes, please your majesty. Oh, it pleases me so well that I will see you wed, and then, with what a haste you can, get you to bed!
Now sleep is slackened, hath the root. No din but snores about the house, made louder by the o'erfed breast of this most pompous marriage feast. The cat with eyne of burning coal now couches from the mouse's hole, and crickets sing at the oven's mouth, and are the blither for their drouth. Hymen hath brought the bride to bed, where by the loss of maidenhead a babe is moulded be a tent and time that is so briefly spent with your fine fancies quaintly each that what's dumb in show i'll plain with speech by many a dern and painful perch of Pericles the careful search, by the four opposing coins which the world together joins, is made with all due diligence that horse and sail and high expense can stead the quest. At last from Tyre, fame answering the most strange inquire, to the court of King Simonides are letters brought, the tenor these. Antiochus and his daughter dead. The men of Tyrus on the head of Helicanus would set on the crown of Tyre, but he will none. The mutiny he there hastes to oppress says to him, if King Pericles come not home in twice six moons, he obedient to their dooms will take the crown, the sum of this brought hither to Pentapolis. Iravished, iravished the regions round, and everyone with claps can sound. Our heir apparent is a king who dreamt, who thought of such a thing. Brief, he must hence depart to Tyre. His queen with child makes her desire, which who shall cross? A long to go, omit we all their dole and woe. Like a reader, her nurse she takes, and so to see. Their vessel shakes on Neptune's billow, half the flood hath their keel cut, but fortune moved varies again. The grizzled north disgorges such a tempest forth that as a duck for life that dives, so up and down the poor ship drives. The lady shrieks and well and near does fall in travail with her fear, and what ensues in this fell storm shall for itself itself perform i nil relate action may conveniently the rest convey which might not what by me is told in your imagination hold this stage the ship upon whose deck the sea tossed pericles appears to speak The God of this great vast rebuke these surges, which wash both heaven and hell. And now that hast upon the winds command, bid them in brass, having called them from the deep. Oh, still thy deafening dreadful thunders, gently quench thy nimble sulfurous flashes. Oh, how, thy corridor, how does my queen? Then storm venomously wilt thou spit all thyself. The seaman's whistle is as a whisper in the ears of death unheard. Like Horida, Lucina, O divinest patroness and midwife gentle to those that cry by night. Convey thy deity aboard our dancing boat, make swift the pangs of my queen's travails. Now, like Horida, here is a thing too young for such a place, who, if it had conceit, would die, as I am like to do. Take in your arms this piece of your dead queen. How? How, my corridor? Patience, good sir, do not assist the storm. Here's all that's left living of your queen, a little daughter. For the sake of it, be manly, take comfort. You gods! Why do you make us love your goodly gifts and snatch them straight away? We here below recall not what we give, and therein may use honor with you. Patience, good sir, even for this charge. Now, my, may thy, be thy life. 
for a more blusterous birth had never babe. Quiet and gentle thy conditions, for thou art the rudest welcome to this world that ever was prince's child. Happy what follows, thou hast as chiding a nativity as fire, air, water, earth, and heaven could make to herald thee from the womb. Even at the first, thy loss is more than can thy portage quit with all thou canst find here. Now the good gods throw their best eyes upon it. What courage, sir? God save you. Courage enough. I do not fear the flaw. It has done to me the worst. Yet for the love of this poor infant, this fresh new seafarer, I would it would be quiet. Slack the bowlines there. Thou wilt not, wilt thou? Blow and split thyself. Let sea room and the brine and cloudy billow kiss the moon, I care not. Sir, your queen must overboard. The sea works high, the wind is loud, and will not lie till the ship be cleared of the dead. That's your superstition. Pardon us, sir. With us at sea, it hath been still observed, and we are strong in custom. Therefore, briefly yield her, for she must overboard straight. As you think me, most wretched queen. Here she lies, sir. A terrible childbed hast thou had, my dear. No light. No fire, the unfriendly elements forgot thee utterly. Nor have I time to give thee hallow to thy grave, but straight was cast thee scarcely coffin in the ooze. Where for a monument upon thy bones and ere remaining lamps, the belching whale and humming water must o'erwhelm thy corpse, lying with simple shells. Will I call it a pit nest to bring me spices, ink, and paper? my casket and my jewels, and bid Nickon to bring me the satin coffin. Lay the babe upon the pillow. Hi thee, whilst I say priestly farewell to her. Suddenly, woman. Sir, we have a chest beneath the hatches, cocked and betumed ready. Well, I thank thee, Mariner. So what coast is this? We are near Tarsus. Thither, gentle mariner, alter thy course for Tyre. When canst thou reach it? By break of day, if the winds cease. Oh, make for Tarsus. There will I visit Cleon, for the, the babe cannot hold out to Tyrus. There I'll leave it at careful nursing. Go thy ways, good mariner, I'll bring the body presently. Tyler and ho! Solomon, get fire and meat for these poor men. It's been a turbulent and stormy night. I have been in many, but such a night as this, till now, I ne'er endured. Your master will be dead ere you return. There's nothing can be ministered to nature that can recover him. Now give this to the pocket theory and tell me how it works. Good morrow. Good morrow to your lordship. Gentlemen, why do you uh, stir so early? Our lodgings, standing bleak upon the sea, shook as the earth did quake. The very principles did seem to rend and all to topple. Pure surprise and fear made me to quit the house. If this is the cause we trouble you so early, it's not our husbandry. Oh, you say well. But I much marvel that your lordship, having rich tire about you, should at these early hours shake off the golden slumber of repose. His most strange nature should be so conversant with pain, being thereto not compelled. I hold it ever. 
Virtue and cunning were endowments greater than nobleness and riches. Careless heirs may the two latter darken and expand, but immortality attends the former, making a man a god. It is known I ever have studied physic, through which secret art, by churning all authorities, I have together with my practice, made familiar to me and to my aid the blessed infusions that dwells in vegetatives, in metals, and in stones, and can speak of the disturbances that nature works, and of her cures, which doth give me a more content in course of true delight than to be thirsty after pottering honour or tie my pleasure up in silken bags to please the fool and death. Your honour has two Ephesus poured forth your charity, and the hundreds call themselves your creatures, who by you have been restored, and not your knowledge, your personal pain, but even your purse, still open, hath built Lord Saruman such strong renown as time shall never... <sighs> So lift there! What's that? Sir, even now did this sea toss upon our shore this chest. Tis of some rack. No, set it down. Let's look about it. Like something, sir. What air it be, tis wondrous heavy. Pinch it open straight. If the sea's stomach be all charged with gold, tis a good constant of fortune it is upon us. <laughs> oh, my lord. <laughs> How close tis caught and bitumid. Did the sea cast it up? I never saw so huge a billow, sir, as tossed it upon shore. Oh, wrench it open. Oh, soft. It smells most sweetly in my sense. Wrench it open. Has ever hit my nostril. So, up with it. Oh! Most potent gods, what's here, of course! Most strange. Shrouded in cloth of state, armed and entreasured with full bags of spices, and a passport, too. Apollo, affect me in the characters. Oh. Here I give to understand, if ere this coffin drives the land, I, King Pericles, have lost this queen, worth all our mundane cost. Who finds her, give her burying. She was the daughter of a king. Besides, this treasure for a fee, the gods requite his charity. Oh, if thou livest, Pericles, thou hast a heart that ever cracks for woe. This chanced tonight. Most likely, sir. Nay, certainly tonight. But look how fresh she looks. They were too rough that threw her in the sea. Hmm. Make a fire within. Fetch hither all my boxes in my closet. Death may usurp on nature many hours, and yet the fire of life kindle again the awe expressed spirits. I heard of an Egyptian that had nine hours lain dead, who was by good appliance recovered. Well said. Well said. The fire and cloths, the rough and woeful music that we have, cause it to sound, beseech you. <laughs> Vile once more, how thou starest, thou block. Music there. <sighs> I pray you give her air, gentlemen. This queen will live. Nature awakens her warm breath out of her, 
She hath not been entranced about five hours. See how she gins to blow into life's flower again. The heavens, through you, increase our wonder and sets up your fame forever. She is alive. Behold her eyelids, faces to those heavenly jewels which Pericles has lost, begin to part their fringes of bright gold. The diamonds of a most praised water doth appear to make the world twice rich. Live, and make us weep to hear your fate, fair creature, there as you seem to be. Oh, dear Diana, where am I? Where's my lord? What world is this? Is not this strange? Most rare! Hush, my gentle neighbours. Lend me your hands. To the next chamber bear her. Get linen. Now this matter must be looked to, for her relapse is mortal. Come, come, and this scalpius hide us. Most honored Cleon, I must needs be gone. My twelve months are expired, and Tyrus stands in a litigious peace. You and your lady take from my heart all thankfulness. The gods make up the rest upon you. Your shakes of fortune, though they haunt you mortally, yet glance full wonderingly on us. Oh, your sweet queen, that the, that the strict fates had pleased you had brought her hither to have blessed mine eyes with her. We cannot but obey the powers above us. Could I rage and roar as doth the sea she lies in? Yet the end must be as tis. My gentle babe, Marina, whom, for she was born at sea, I have named so, here I charge her charity with all, leaving her the infant of your care beseeching you to give her princely training that she may be married as she is born. Fear not, my lord, but think your grace that fed my country with your corn, for which the people's prayers still fall upon you, must in your child be thought on. If neglection should therein make me vile, the common body by you relieved would force me to my duty. But... If to that my nature need a spur, the gods revenge it upon me and mine to the end of generation. I believe you. Your honor and your goodness teach me to it without your vows. Till she be married, madam, by bright Diana, whom we honor all unscissored, shall this hair of mine remain, though I show ill in it. So I take my leave. Good madam, make me blessed in your care in bringing up my child. I have one myself. You shall not be more dear to my respect than yours, my lord. Madam, my thanks and prayers. We'll bring your grace even to the edge of the shore, then give you up to the mast Neptune and the gentlest winds of heaven. I will embrace your offer. Come, dearest madam. Oh no, tears. My corded, no tears. Look to your little mistress on whose grace you may depend hereafter. Come, my lord. Madam, this letter and some certain jewels lay with you in your coffer, which are at your command. Know you the character? It is my lord's. That I was shipped at sea, I well remember, even on my bearing time. But whether they're delivered by the holy gods, I cannot rightly say. But since King Pericles, my wedded lord, I'll ne'er shall see again, a vestal livery will take me to and never more have joy. Madam, if this your purpose as you speak, Diana's temple is not distant far, where you may abide till your date expire. Moreover, if you please, a niece of mine shall there attend you. My recompense is thanks, that's all. Yet my good will is great, though the gift small.
Thy oath, remember, thou hast sworn to do it. Tis but a blow which never shall be known. Thou canst not do a thing in the world so soon to yield thee so much profit. Let not conscience, which is but cold and flaming love in thy bosom, inflame too nicely. Ne'er let pity, which even woman hath cast off, melt thee, but be a soldier to thy purpose. I will do it, but yet she is a goodly creature. Well, the fitter then, the God should have her. Here she comes weeping for her only mistress in death. <laughs> Thou art resolved. I am resolved. No, I will rob Talus of her weed to strew thy green with flowers. The yellows, blues, the purple violets and marigolds shall as a carpet hang upon thy grave while summer days doth last. Hey, can we I stop know. for a second? I think we missed I'm so Gower. Sorry, I'm so yeah, I got sorry. <laughs> I've been. Imagine Pericles arrived at Tyre, welcomed and settled to his own desire. His woeful queen we leave at Ephesus. Unto Diana there's a votaress. Now to Marina bend your mind, whom our fast growing scene must find at Tarsus and by Cleon train in music, letters, who hath gained of education all the grace, which makes high both the art and place of general wonder, but alack, that monster envy oft the rack of earned praise, Marina's life, seeks to take off by treason's knife, and in this kind our Cleon hath, one daughter and a full-grown wench, even ripe for marriage right this maid, high Philoton, and it is said, for certain in our story she, would ever with Marina be, be it when they weaved the slided silk, with fingers long, small, white as milk, or when she would, with sharp needle wound, the cambric which she made more sound, by hurting it, or when to the lute, she sung and made the night bird mute, that still records with moan, or when she would with rich and constant pen, veil to her mistress Diane still, this filleton contends in skill with absolute marina. So with the dove of Paphos might the crow, by feathers white, marina gets all praises which are paid as debt and not as given, so this so darks in filleton, all graceful marks that Cleon's wife, with envy rare, a present murderer does prepare for good Marina, that her daughter might stand peerless by this slaughter. The sooner her vile thoughts to stead, Lycorida, our nurse, is dead, and cursed Dionysa hath the pregnant instrument of wrath. Pressed for this blow, the unborn event, I do commend to your content. Only I carry winged time, post on the lame feet of my rhyme, which never could I so convey, unless your thoughts went on my way. Dionysa does appear with Leonine, a murderer. Thy oath remember. Thou hast sworn to do it. Tis but a blow which never shall be known. Thou canst not do a thing in the world so soon to yield thee so much profit. Let not conscience, which is but cold and flaming, thy bosom inflame too nicely, nor let pity, which even woman have cast off, melt thee, but be a soldier to thy purpose. I will do it, but yet she is a goodly creature. The fitter then, the God should have her. Here she comes, weeping for her only mistress's death. <laughs> Thou art resolved. I am resolved. No, I will rob Talis of her weed to strew thy green with flowers. The yellows, blues, the purple violets and marigolds shall as a carpet hang upon thy grave while summer days doth last. My me, poor maid, born in a tempest when my mother died. This world to me is as lasting storm, worrying me for my friends. Oh, how now, Marina? 
Why do you keep alone? How chance my daughter's not with you? Do not consume your blood with sorrowing. Have you a nurse of me? Lord, how your favors change with that unprofitable woe. Come, give me your flowers. Or the sea marge, walk with me and mine. The air is quick there and it pierces the and sharpens the stomach. Come, Leonine, take her by the arm, walk with her. No, I pray you, I'll not bereave you of your servant. Come, <laughs> come. Oh, I love the king, your father, and yourself with more than foreign art, heart. We, we every day expect him here. When he shall come and find our paragon to all reports thus bl blasted, he will repent the breadth of his great voyage. Blame both my lord and me that we were, have taken no care to your best courses. Go, I pray you walk and be cheerful once again. Reserve that excellent complexion, which did steal the eyes of young and old. Care not for me. I can go home alone. Well, I will go, but yet I have no desire to it. Come. Um, I know it is good for you. Walk half an hour, Leonine, at the least. Remember what I've said. I warrant you, madam. I leave you, sweet lady, for a while. Play walk softly. Do not heat your blood. Why, <laughs> I must have care of you. Thanks, sweet madam. Is this wind westerly that blows? Southwest. When I was born, the wind was north. Was it so? My father, as nurse says, did never fear, but cried, good seamen, to the sailors, galling his kingly hands, hailing ropes, and clasping to the mast, endured a sea that almost burst the deck. When was this? When I was born. Never was waves nor wind more violent and from the ladder tackle washes off a canvas climber. Ha, says one, wilt out. And with a dro dropping industry, they skip from stern to stern. The boatswain whistles, and the master calls and trebles their confusion. Come, say your prayers. What mean you? If you require a little space for prayer, I grant it. Pray, but be not tedious, for the gods are quick of ear, and I am sworn to do my work with haste. Why will you kill me? To satisfy my lady. Why would she have me killed? Now, as I can remember by troth, I never did hurt her in all my life. I never spake bad word, nor did I did ill turn to any living creature. Believe me, la, I never killed a mouse nor hurt a fly. I trod upon a worm against my will, but I wept for it. How have I offended wherein my death might yield her any profit, or my life imply her any danger? My commission is not a reason of the deed, but to do it. You will not do it for all the world, I hope. You are well favored, and your looks for show, for show you have a gentle heart. I saw you lately, when you caught hurt in parting to that thought. Good sooth, it showed well in you. Do so now. If your lady seeks my life, come you between and save poor me, the weaker. I am sworn and will dispatch. Hold, villain! A prize, a prize. I have fought, mates. I have fought. Come, let's have her abroad suddenly. These roguing thieves serve the great pirate Valdez, and they've seized Marina. Let her go. There's no hope she will return. I'll swear she's dead and thrown into the sea. But I'll see further. Perhaps they will but please themselves upon her, not carry her aboard. If she remain whom they've ravished, must by me be slain. Sir, touch the market narrowly. It's full of gallants. We lost too much money this month by being too restless. 
we were never so much out of creatures. We have but poor three, and they can do no more than they can do. And they with continual action are even as good as rotten. Therefore, let's have fresh ones. What are we paying for them? If there be not a conscience to be need in every trade, we shall never prosper. No, oh, thou sayest true. Tis not our bringing up of poor bastards, as I think I have brought up some eleven. I to eleven and brought them down again, but shall I search the market? What else, man? The stuff we have. <laughs> A strong wind will blow it to pieces. They are so pitifully sodden. Oh, thou sayst true. There's too unwholesome a conscience. Poor Francois Bainan is dead that lay with the little baggage. Aye, she quickly pooped him. She made him roast meat for worms. I'll go search the market. Hmm. Three or four thousand trackings were as pretty a proportion to live quietly and so give over. Hmm. Why to give over, I pray you? Is it a shame to get when we are old? No. When it comes not in like the commodity, nor the commodity wages not with the danger. Therefore, hmm. if at our years we could pick up some pretty estate, why not make a miss to keep our door open? Besides, the sole terms we stand upon with the gods will be strong with us for giving over. Come, <laughs> other sorts offend as well as we. As well as we? I am better too. We offend worse. Neither is our profession any trade. It's no calling. Here it comes both. Oh. Come your ways, my master. You say she's a virgin? Oh, sir, we doubt it not. Master, I have gone through for this piece, you see. If you like her, so if not, I have lost my earnest. Hmm. Both. Has she any qualities? She has a good face, speaks well, and has excellent good clothes. There's no farther necessity of qualities can make her be refused. What's her price, Bolt? I cannot be baited one droid of a thousand pieces. Well, follow me, my masters. You shall have your money presently. Why, type her in, instruct her in what she has to do, that she may not be raw in her entertainment. Bolt. Take you the marks of her, the color of her hair, complexion, height, her age, with warrant of her virginity, and cry, he that will give most shall have her first. <laughs> Such a maidenhead were no cheap thing, if men were as they have been. Get this done, as I command you. Performance shall follow. Alack, that Leonine, Leonine was so slack, so slow. You should have struck, not spoke, or that these pirates, not even barbarous, had but over bound, overthrown me for to seek my mother. Oh, why lament you, pretty one? That I am pretty. Come, the gods have done their part in you. I accuse them not. You are light into my hands, where you are like to live. The more my fault to escape his hand where I was to die. Aye, and you shall live in pleasure. No. Yes, indeed shall you, and taste gentlemen of all fashions. You shall fare well. You shall have the difference of all complexions. What? Do you stop your ears? Are you a woman? And what would you have me be? And I be not a woman? An honest woman or not a woman? Marry with the gosling. I think I shall have something to do with you. Come, you're a young, foolish sapling and must be bowed as I would have you. 
The gods defend me. <laughs> if it please the gods to defend you by men, then men must comfort you. Men must feed you. Men stir you up. <laughs> well, boats returned. Now, sir, hast thou cried her through the market? I have cried her almost to the number of her hairs. I have drawn her picture with my voice. And I prithee tell me, how dost thou find the inclination of the people, especially of the younger sort? Faith, they listened to me as they would have hearkened to their father's testament. Mm -hmm. There was a Spaniard's mouth watered and he went to bed to her very description. We shall have him here tomorrow with his best ruff on. Tonight, tonight. But mistress, do you know the French knight that covers in the hams? Who? Monsieur Verrolles? Aye, he. He offered to cut a caper at the proclamation, but he made a groan at it and swore he would see her tomorrow. <laughs> well, well. As for him, uh, he brought his disease hither. Here he does but repair it. I know he will come in our shadow to scatter his crowns in the sun. Well, if we had of every nation a traveler, we should lodge them with this sign. Pray you, come hither a while. You have fortunes coming upon you. Mark me. You must seem to do that fearfully, which you commit willingly. Despise profit where you have most gain. To weep that you live as you do makes pity in your lovers. Seldom but that pity begets you a good opinion, and that opinion a mere profit. I understand you not. <sighs> Oh, take her home, mistress, take her home. These blushes of hers must be quenched with some present practice. Hmm. Thus say it's true in faith, so they must. For your bridge goes to that with shame, which is her way to go with warrant. Faith, some do and some do not. But mistress, if I have bargained for the joint. Thou mayest cut a morsel off the spit. I may so. <laughs> Who should deny it? Come, young one. I like the manner of your garments as well. I, by my faith, they shall not be changed yet. Bolt, spend thou that in the town. Report what a sojourner we have. You lose nothing by custom. When nature framed this piece, she meant thee a good turn. Therefore say what a paragon she is, and thou hast the harvest of thine own report. I warrant you, mistress, thunder shall not so awake the beds of eels as my giving out her beauty stirs up the lewdly inclined. <laughs> I'll bring home some tonight. Come your ways, follow me. If fires be hot, knives sharp or waters deep, untied I still my virgin knot will keep. Diana, aid my purpose. <laughs> what have we to do with Diana, pray you? Will you go with us? Why are you foolish? Can it be undone? Oh, Diana is such a piece of slaughter. The sun and moon never see. The sun and moon ne'er looked upon. I think you'll turn a child again. Were I chief lord of all this spacious world, I'd give it to undo the deed. A lady much less in blood than virtue, yet a princess to equal any single crown of the earth, the justice of compare. O oh, villain Leonine, whom thou hast poisoned to, if thou hadst drunk to him, to have been kindness, becoming well thy face. What canst thou say when noble Pericles shall demand his child? She's dead. Nurses are not the face. To foster is not ever to preserve. 
She died at night, I'll say so. Who can cross it unless you play the imperious innocent and for an honest tribute cry out, she died by foul play. Go to, well, well, of all the faults beneath the heavens, the gods do not like this worst. Be one of those that thinks of petty wrens of Tarsus will fly hence and open this to Pericles. I do shame to think what a noble strain you are and of how coward a spirit. To such proceeding, whoever but his approbation added, though not his prime consent, he did not flow from honorable courses. Be it so then, yet none does know but you how she came dead, nor none can know Leonine being gone. She did disdain my child and stood between her and her fortunes. None would look on her, but cast their gazes on Marina's face, whilst ours was blooded, blurted at and held a malkin, not worth the time of day. It pierced me through. And though I, and though you call my course unnatural, you not your child's well loving, yet I find it greets me as an enterprise of kindness performed to your soul slaughter, daughter. Heavens forgive it. And as for Pericles, what should he say? We wept after her hearse, and yet we mourn. Her monument is almost finished, and her epithets, epitaphs in glittering gold characters express a general praise to her and care in us at whose expense tis done. Thou art like the harpy, which to betray dost with thine angel's face, seize with thine eagle's talons. You are like one that surreptitiously do swear to the gods that whether kills the flies. But yet, I know you'll do as I advise. Thus time we waste and long leagues make short. Sail seas in cockles and have wish but fought. Making to take our imagination from born to born, region to region, by you being pardoned, we commit no crime to use one language in each several clime. Where our scenes seem to live, I do beseech you to learn of me who stand in the gaps to teach you the stages of our story. Pericles is now again thwarting the wayward seas, attended on by many a lord and knight, to see his daughter all his life's delight. Old Helicanus goes along behind, goes, uh, goes along behind, is left to govern it. You bear in mind old Ascanes, whom Helicanus late advanced in time to great and high estate. Well sailing ships and bounteous winds have brought this king to Tarsus. Think his pilot thought, so with his steerage shall your thoughts go on, to fetch his daughter home, who first is gone. Like motes and shadows, you'll see them move a while. Your, your ears and to your eyes, I'll reconcile. See how belief may suffer by foul show, this borrowed passion stands for true old woe, and Pericles in sorrow all devoured, with sighs shot through and biggest tears o'er showered, leaves Tarsus and again embarks. He swears never to wash his face nor cut his hairs. He puts on sackcloth and to sea he bears, a tempest which his mortal vessel tears, and yet he rides it out. Now please you wit, the epitaph is for Marina writ by wicked Dionysus. The fairest, sweetest, and best lies here, who withered in her spring of year. She was of Tyrus, the king's daughter, on whom foul death hath made this slaughter. Marina was she called, and at her birth, Thetis, being proud, swallowed some part of the earth. Therefore the earth, fearing to be o'erflowed, hath Thetis's birth child on the heavens bestowed. There, wherefore she does, and swears she'll never stint, make raging battery upon shores of flint. No visor does become black villainy so well as soft and tender flattery. 
Let Pericles believe his daughter's dead and bear his courses to be ordered. By Lady Fortune, while our scene must play, his daughter's woe and heavy well a day. In her unholy service, patience then, and think you now we are all in Myrtle. Did you ever hear the like? No, not ever, not never shall do in such a place as this. She been once gone. But to have divinity preached there. Did you ever dream of such a thing? No, no. Come, um, I am for no more bawdy, bawdy houses. Shall go hear the vestal sing? I'll do anything now that is virtuous, but I am out of the road of rutting forever. What well, I would rather have twice the work of her, she'd never come here. Come on, get out of here. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd rather twice the worth of her than she had never come here. Oh, fie, fie upon her. She's able to freeze the god Priapus and undo a whole generation. We must either get her ravished or be rid of her. When she should do for clients her fit and do me the kindness of our profession, she has me her quirks, her reasons, her master reasons, her prayers, her knees, that she would make a Puritan of the devil if he would cheapen a kiss of her. Faith, I must ravish her or she'll disfurnish us of all our cavalaria and make our swearers priests. Now the pox upon her green sickness for me. Faith, there's no way to be rid on it, but by the way to the pox. Here comes the Lord Lysimachus disguised. We should have both Lord and Lone if the peevish baggage would but give way to customers. How now? How a dozen of virginites? <laughs> Now the gods to bless your honor. I am glad to see your honor in good health. Ah, uh, you may so. Tis the better for you that you resorters stand upon sound legs. How now? Wholesome inquity have you that a man may deal with all and defy the surgeon. Oh, we have one here, sir, if she would. But there never came her like in my Tallinn. If she'd do the deeds of darkness, thou wouldst say? <laughs> Your honor knows what tis to say well enough. Well, call forth, call forth. For flesh and blood, sir, white and red, you shall see a rose. And she were a rose indeed, if she had but. What, what? Pretty. Oh, sir, I can be modest. That dignifies the renown of a bod no less than it gives a good report to a number to be chased. Here comes that which grows to the stalk, never plucked yet, I can assure you. Is she not a fair creature? Faith. She would serve after a long voyage at sea. Well, there's for you. <clears throat> leave us. I beseech your honor. Give me leave a word and I'll have done presently. I beseech you, do. First, I would have you note, this is an honorable man. 
desire to find him so that I may worthily note him. Next, he's the governor of this country and a man with whom I am bound to. If he govern the country, you are bound to him indeed. But how honorable he is in, in that I know not. Pray you, without any more virginal fencing, will you use him kindly? He will line your apron with gold. What he will do graciously, I will thankfully receive. Ah, you done? My lord, she's not paced yet. You must take some pains to work her to your manage. Come, we will leave his honor and her together. Go thy ways. Now, pretty one, how long have you been at this trade? What trade, sir? Why, I cannot name it, but I shall offend. <laughs> I cannot be offended with, with my trade. Please, you name it. How long have you been at this profession? Ever since I can remember. Did, did you go to it so young? Were you a, a gamester at five or at seven? Earlier too, sir. Now I be one. Why, the, the house you dwell in, it, it proclaims you to be a creature of sale. Do you know this house to be a place of such resort and will come into it? I hear you say you're of honorable parts and are the governor of this place. Why? Hath your principal made known unto you who I am? Who is my principal? Why? <laughs> you're her woman. She, she that sets seeds and roots of shame and in, iniquity. Oh, you have, you have heard something of my power and so stand aloof for, for more serious wooing. But I protest to thee, pretty one, my authority shall not see thee or else look friendly upon me. Come, bring me to some private place. Come, come. If you were born to honor, show it now. If put upon you, make the judgment good that th that thought you worthy of it. Well, how's this? How's this? Some more. Be sage. For me, that I'm a maid, though most ungentle fortune have placed me in this sty where I where since I came, diseases have been sold dearer than physic, that the gods would set me free from this unhallowed place, though they did change me to the meanest bird that flies or, or the pure air. I did not think thou could have spoke so well, never dreamt thou couldst. Had I, had I brought hither a corrupted mind, thy speech had altered it. Hold, here's gold for thee. <clears throat> Preserve in the, that clear way thou goest, and the gods strengthen thee. The good gods preserve you. For me, be you thoughten that I came in with no ill intent. For me, the very doors of, and windows savor vilely. Fare thee well, thou art a piece of virtue, and I doubt not but thy training hath be noble. Oh, here's more gold to thee. I curse upon him, die he like a thief that robes thee of thy goodness. If thou dost hear from me, it shall be for thy good. I beseech your honor, one piece for me. <laughs> thou damned doorkeeper. Your house but for this virgin that doth profit would sink and overwhelm you. Away! How's this? We must take another course with you? If your peevish chastity, which is not worth a breakfast in the cheapest country under the cup, shall undo a whole household, let me be gelded like a spaniel. Come your ways. Whither would you have me? 
I must have your maiden head taken off, or the common hangman shall execute it. Come your way. We'll have no more gentlemen driven away. Come your way, as I say. Come oh, now. What's the matter? Worse and worse, mistress. She has here spoken holy words to the Lord Lysacamus. Oh, abominable. He makes our profession, as it were, to stink afore the face of the gods. Mary, hang her up forever. The nobleman would have dealt with her like a nobleman, and she sent him away as cold as a snowball, saying his prayers, too. Oh, take her away. Use her at thy pleasure. Crack the glass of her virginity and make the rest malleable. And if she were a thornier piece of ground than she is, she shall be ploughed. Hark, hark, you gods. <gasps> she conjures. Away with her. Would she had never come within my doors. Mary, hang you. She's born to undo us. Will you not go the way of womankind? Mary, come up my dish of chastity with rosemary and bays. Come, mistress, come your way with me. Whither wilt thou have me? To take from you the jewel you hold so dear. Prithee, tell me one thing first. Come now, your one thing. What canst thou wish thine enemy to be? Why, I could wish him to be my master, or rather, my mistress. Neither of those are so bad as thou art, since they do better thee in their command. Thou holdst a place for which the painted fiend of hell would not in reputation change. Thou art the damned doorkeeper up to every costural that comes inquiring for his tib. To the choleric fisting of every rogue, thy ear is liable. Thy food is such as hath been belched in by on, on by infectious lungs. What would you have me do? Go to the wars, would you? Where a man may serve seven years for the loss of a leg and have not money enough in the end to buy him a wooden one? Do anything but thou dost. Empty old receptacles or common shores of filth. Serve by indenture to the common hangman. Any of those ways are yet better than this. For what thou professest, a baboon, could he speak, would own a name too dear, that the gods would safely deliver me from this place. Here, here's gold for thee. If that thy master would gain by me, proclaim that I can sing, weave, sew, and dance, with other virtues which I'll keep from boast, and will undertake all these to teach. I doubt not, but this populous city will yield many scholars. But can you teach all this you speak of? Prove that I cannot. Take me home again and prostitute me to the basest groom that doth frequent your house. Well, I will see what I can do for thee. If I can place thee, I will. But among honest women. Faith. My acquaintance lies little amongst them, but since my master and mistress hath bought you, there is no going but by their consent. Therefore, I will make them acquainted with your purpose, and I doubt not that I shall find them tractable enough. Come, I'll do for thee what I can. Come your ways. Marina thus the brothel scapes and chances into an honest house, our story says. She sings like one immortal and she dances as goddess-like to her admired, admired lays. Deep clerks she dumbs and with her kneel composes nature's own shape of bud, bud, bird, branch or berry that even her art sisters, the natural roses. Her inkle silk twin with the rubied cherry, that pupils lacks she none of noble race, who pour their bounty on her and her gain, she gives the cursed board. Here we her place, and to her father turn our thoughts again, 
Where we left him on the sea, we there him lost. Where driven before the winds, he is arrived. Here where his daughter dwells, and on this coast, suppose him now at anchor, the city strived, God Neptune's annual feast to keep from whence. Lysimachus, our Tyrian ship, espies, his banners sable trimmed with rich expense, and to him in his barge with fervor hies. In your supposing, once more put your sight of heavy Pericles. Think this his bark, where what is done in action, more if might, shall be discovered. Please you, sit and hark. Where is Lord Helicanus? He can resolve you. Oh, here he is. Sir, there was a barge put off from Melitene, and in it is Lysimachus, the governor who craves to come aboard. What is your will? That he have his. Call up some gentlemen. Dude. Uh, yo, gentlemen, my lord calls. Doth your lordship call? <sighs> gentlemen. There is some of worth would come aboard. I pray, greet him fairly. Sir, this is the man that can, you know, to would resolve you. Hail, reverend sir. The gods preserve you. And you, to outlive the age I am and die as I would do. You wish me well. Being on shore, honoring of Neptune's triumphs, seeing this go goodly vessel ride before us, I made it to know of whence you are. First, what is your place? <laughs> I am the governor of this place you lie before. Sir, our vessel is of Tyre, in it the king, a man for who for this three months hath not spoken to anyone, nor taken sustenance, but to prorogue his grief. <clears throat> Upon what ground in, is his distemperature? Should we be too tedious to repeat, but the main grief springs from the loss of a beloved daughter and a wife. May we not see him? You may, but bootless is your sight. He will not speak to any. <clears throat> you may, uh, let, let me obtain my wish. Behold him. This was a goodly person, till the disaster that one mortal night drove him to this. Sir King, all hail, the gods preserve you, hail, royal sir. It is in vain, he will not speak to you. Uh, sir, we have a maid in Mytilene, I durst wager would win some words of him. Tis well be thought. <laughs> she, questionless with her sweet harmony and other chosen attractions, would allure and make a battery, though his defended ports, which now are midway stopped. <laughs> she is all happy as the fairest of all, and with her fellow maid is now upon the leafy shelter that ab abuts against the island's side. Sure, all effectless, yet nothing will omit that bear recovery's name. But since your kindness we have stretched thus far, let us beseech you that for our gold we may provision have, wherein we are not destitute for want, but weary for the staleness. Oh, sir, <laughs> a courtesy which if we should deny the most just God for every graft would send a caterpillar and, and so inflict our province. Yet, yet once more, let me entreat to know at large the cause of your king's 
sorrow. Sit, sir. I will recount it to you. But see, I am prevented. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> well, here's the lady that I sent for. <laughs> Welcome, fair one. <laughs> Is it not a goodly presence? She's a gallant lady. <laughs> oh, she is one of that, where I well assured came of a gentle kind and noble stock. I'd wish no better choice and, and think me rarely wed. Fair one, all goodness that consists in beauty, except even here where is a kingly patient if that thy prosperous and artificial feet draw him but to answer thee in aught thy sacred physic shall receive such pay as thy desires can wish sir i will use my utmost skill in his recovery provided that none but i and my companion maid be suffered to come near him <laughs> come 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 let us let us leave her and and the gods make her prosperous uh, He, your music, marked he your music. Nor, no, no, nor looked on us. Uh, see, she will speak to him. Well, sir, my lord, lend ear. Ah! I am a maid, my lord, that never before invited eyes, but have been gazed on like a comet. She speaks, my lord, that may hath be interred a grief might equal yours, if both were justly weighted. Though wayward fortune did malign my state, my derivation was from ancestors who stood equivalent with mighty kings. But time hath rooted out my parentage, and to the world in awkward casualties bound me in servitude. I will desist, but there is nothing but there's something glows upon my cheek and whispers in mine ear. Go not till he speak. My fortunes, parentage, good parentage, Teagle. Is it not thus? What say you? I said, my lord, if you did know my parentage, you would not do me violence. I do think so. Pray you turn your eyes upon me. You're like something that, what? Country woman, fear of these shores. No, nor of any shores. Yet I was mortally brought forth and am no other than I appear. I am great with woe, and shall deliver weeping. My dearest wife was like this maid, and such a one my daughter might have been. My queen's square brow, her stature to an inch, as one like straight as silver voice, her eyes as jewel like, encased as richly in pace. Another Juno, who stars the ears she feeds and makes them hungry the more she gives them speech. Where do you live? Where I am but a stranger. From the deck you may discern the place. Where were you bred? And how achieved you these endowments which you make more rich to owe? If I should tell you my history, it would seem like lies disdained in the reporting. Where do they speak? Falseness cannot come from me, for thou lookst modest as justice, and thou seemest a palace for the crown of truth to dwell in. I will believe thee, and make my senses credit thy relation to points that seem impossible, for thou lookst like one I loved indeed. What were thy friend? Didst thou not say when I did push thee back, which was when I perceived thee, thou, thou camest from good descending. So indeed I did. Report thy parentage. I think thou saidst thou had been tossed from wrong to injury, that 
thou thoughts thy griefs might equal mine if both were open. Some such thing I said and said no more but what my thoughts did warrant me as was likely. Tell thy story. If thine considered prove the thousandth part of my endurance, thou art a man and I have suffered like a girl. Yet thou dost look with patience, gazing on the king's grave and smiling extremity out of it. What were thy friends? How lost thou them that thy name? By most kind virgin, recount, I do beseech thee. Here, come sit by me. My name is Marina. Oh, I am mocked. And now by some incessant gods sent hither to make the world go to laugh at me. Patience, good sir, or here I'll cease. Yeah, I'll be patient. Thou little knowest how thou dost startle me to call myself Marina. The name was given me by one that had some power, my father and a king. How? Oh, a king's daughter and, and called Marina? You said you would believe me. Not to be a troubler of, of your peace, I will end here. But are you flesh and blood? Have you a working pulse and are no fairy? Motion. Oh, speak on. Where were you born and wherefore called Marina? Called Marina, for I was born at sea. Sea? What mother? My mother was the daughter of a king who died the minute I was born. As my good nurse, my contria, hath oft delivered weeping. Oh, stop there a little. Oh, it's the rarest dream that e'er dull sleep did mock sad fools with all. This cannot be. My daughter buried. Oh, where were you bred? I'll hear you more to the bottom of your story and there interrupt you. You scorn. Believe me, it were best I did give over. I will believe you by the syllable of what you should deliver. You give me leave. How can you to these parts where were you bred? The king my father did in Tarsus leave me, till cruel Cleon with his wicked wife did seek to murder me, and having wooed a villain to attempt it, who, having drawn to it, a crew of pirates came and rescued me, brought me to my Tilene. But good sir, whither will you have me? Why do you weep? And maybe you think me an imposter. No good faith, I am the daughter of King Pericles. If good King Pericles be. Oh, Elicatus. False, my lord? Thou art a grave and noble counselor, most wise in general. Tell me, if thou canst, what this maid is, or what is like to be, that this hath made me weep. I, I know not, but here's the regent, sir, of Mytilene, speaks nobly of her. She, she would never tell her parentage. Being demanded that, she would sit still and weep. Oh, Elegatus, strike me, honored sir. Give me a gash, put me to present pain, let this, lest this great sea of joy is rushing upon me or bear the shores of my mortality and drown me with their sweetness. Oh, come here thou, thou that begs him that did thee beget, thou that was born at sea, buried at Tarsus and found at sea again. Oh, thou this down on thy knees. Thank the holy gods as loud as thunder threatens us. This is Marina. What was thy mother's name? Tell me what that, but truth can never be confirmed enough, though doubts ever did sleep. First, sir, I pray, what is your title? I'm Pericles of Tyre. But tell me now my drowned queen's name. As in the rest you said, thou hadst been godlike, perfect, the heir of kingdoms. And another life to Pericles, thy father. 
is not no more to be your daughter than to say my mother's name was Thysia. Thysia was my mother who did end the minute I began. And have mercy on me. Rise out, my child. Give me, God, give me fresh garments, mine own helicanus. She's not dead in Tarsus, as she should have been by savage Cleon. She shall tell thee all when thou shall kneel and justify and knowledge she is my very princess. Who oh, is this? Oh, uh, sir, uh, tis the governor of Mytilene, who, hearing of your melancholy state, did come to see you. I embrace you. Give me my robes. I'm wild in my becoming. Oh, heavens, oh, bless my girl. But hark, what music. <laughs> tell Elecanus my Marina, tell him more, point by point. For said he seems to doubt. How sure you are my daughter. God, but what music? <laughs> my lord, I hear none. None? <laughs> the music of the spears. List, my Marina. It is not good to cross him. Give him way. Oh, rare sounds. <laughs> Do you not hear? M music, my lord, I, I, I hear. Most heavenly music, it nips me under listening and makes slumber. I pull my eyes. Let me rest. A pillow, a pillow for his head. So leave him all. Well, my companion friends, if, if this is but answer to just my belief, I, I will, well, I will well remember you. My temple stands in Ephesus, I the hither, and do upon mine altar sacrifice there when my maiden priests are met together, before the people all reveal how thou at sea dost lose thy wife to mourn thy crosses with thy daughters. Call and give them repetition to their life or perform my bidding or thou livest in woe. Do it and happy be my silver bow. Awake and tell thy dream. Celestial Diane. Goddess Argentine, I will obey thee. Elecanus. Sir. My purpose was for Tarsus, there to strike the inhospitable Cleon, but I am for other service, for toward Ephesus, turn our blown sails. As soon as I'll tell thee why. Shall we refresh us, sir, upon your shore and give you gold for such provision as our intents will need? Sir. With all my heart. And when you do come ashore, I have another suit. You shall prevail were it to woo my daughter, for it seems you have been noble towards her. Sir, lend me, lend me your arm. Come, my Marina. Now our sands are almost run, more a little and then dumb. This my last boon give me, for such kindness must relieve me, that you aptly will suppose what pageantry, what feats, what shows, what minstrelsy and pretty din the regent made in Myrtle to greet the king. So he thrived, that he is promised to be wived to fair Marina, but in no wise, till he had done his sacrifice, as Diane bade, whereto being bound, the interim pray you, all confound. In feathered briefness sails are filled, and wishes fall out as their willed. At Ephesus, the temples see, our king and all his company, that he can hither come so soon, is by your fancies thankful doom. 
Hail Diane. To perform thy just command, I here confess myself the king of Tyre. Who, frighted from my country, did wed at Pentapolis the fair Thysa. At sea, in childbed, died she, but brought forth a maid child called Marina, whom, O oh goddess, wears yet thy silver livery. She at Tarsus was nursed with Cleon, who at 14 years he sought to murder. But her better stars brought her to Mytilene, against whose shore riding her fortunes brought the maid aboard us, where by her own most clear remembrance she made known herself my daughter. Voice and favor, you are, you are a royal Pericles. What means the nun? She dies, help, gentlemen. No more, sir. If you have told Diana's altar true, this is your wife. Reverend Appear, no! I threw her overboard with these very arms. Upon this coast, I warrant you. Tis most certain. Look to the lady. Oh, she's but overjoyed. Early one blustering morn, this lady was thrown upon this shore. I oped the coffin, found their rich jewels, recovered her, and placed her here in Diana's temple. May we see them? Great sir, they shall be brought you to my house, whither I invite you. Look, I say is recovered, Lind. Oh. oh, let me look. If it be none of mine by sanctity, Will to my sense bend the licentious ear, the curb it, in spite of seeing, oh, my lord, are you not Pericles? Like him you spake, like him you are. Did you not name a tempest of birth and a death? The voice of dead, they, sir. I saw, am I, supposed dead and drowned? I am mortal, Diane. <sighs> now I know you better. When we with tears parted Pentapolis, the king my father gave you such a ring. This, this, no more, you God. See, your present kindness makes my past misery sports. You should do well that on the touching of her lips I may melt and no more be seen. Oh, come be buried a second time within these arms. My heart kneeling, my heart leaps to be gone into my mother's bosom. Look who kneels here. Flesh of thy flesh, thy of thy burden at the sea and called Marina, for she was yielded there. Blessed and mine own. Hail, madam, and my queen. I know you not. Oh, you have heard me say when I did fly from Tyre, I left behind an ancient substitute. Can you remember what I called the man? I have, I've named him oft. Twas Helicanus then. Still confirmation. Oh, embrace him, dear Thysa, this is he. Now do I long to hear how you were found, how possibly preserved and who to thank. Oh besides the gods, for this great miracle. Lord Saramon, my lord, this man, through whom the gods have shown their power that can from first to last resolve you. Reverend sir, the gods can have no mortal officer more like a god than you. Will you deliver how this dead queen relives? I will, my lord. Beseech you first go with me to my house where shall be shown you all was found with her, how she became placed there in the temple. No needful thing omitted. Sure, Diane, I bless thee for thy vision and will offer night ob oblations to thee. I so this prince, fair betrothed of your daughter, shall marry her at Pentapolis. Now this ornament <laughs> makes me look dismal. I will clip to form. I want this 14 years no razor touched to grace thy marriage day and beautify. Lord Saramon had letters of good credit, sir. My father's dead. Heavens, make a star of him. 
Yet there my queen will celebrate their nuptials and ourselves will in that kingdom spend our following days. Our son and daughter shall in Tyrus reign. Lord Saruman, we do our longing stay to hear the rest untold. Sir, leads the way. In Antiochus and his daughter, you have heard of monstrous lust, the Jew, and just reward. In Pericles, his queen and daughter seen, although assailed with fortune fierce and keen, virtue preserved from fell destruction's blast. Led on by heaven and crowned with joy at last, in Helicanus, may you well descry a figure of truth, of faith, of loyalty. In reverend ceremon there well appears the word that learned charity I wears. For wicked Cleon and his wife, when fame had spread his cursed deed to the honoured name of Pericles to rage the city turn, that him and his they in his palace burn. The gods for murder seemed so content to punish, although not done, but meant. So on your patience, evermore attending, new joy wait on you. Here, our play has ended. 